with the group called The Second Coming. And my friend and I had come there to see Dickie Betts, who was the guitar player for uh, The Second Coming. And we really wanted to hear Dickie Betts, man. <laughs> and we didn't know this. There was this guy on stage, and he had long, long hair, and he kept looking down, and his hair was in his face, and he looked like Cousin It. <laughs> And we had no idea who this guy was, and it was Dwayne Allman. And so my friend and I were heckling him. We were going, who is this guy? Let Dickie play. Dickie can play circles around this dude. We came to hear Dickie. So that very same week, uh, he got together a jam at the Gray House with um, everybody except Greg Allman. Uh, it was J-Mo, Butch Trucks. Uh, Barry Oakley, Dickie Betts, and the keyboard player was, um, oh, my mind draws a blank. Anyway, beg your pardon? No, no, it was way earlier than that. So anyway, uh, Reese Wine is what's his name, Reese, Reese Wine. It's who's gone on to play with uh, Deborah McClinton and Stevie Ray Vaughan. He's now playing with Joe Bonamassa, so he's no slouch, let me tell you. So they had this, this jam on uh, March the 23rd, which is... 50 years ago. God, that's hard to believe. 50 years ago, they had this jam, and Dwayne said, okay, anybody who tries to leave this room, nobody's going to leave this room. You're going to have to fight your way out, or you're going to be in my band. Except for Reese. They decided they didn't need two keyboard players. So Greg Allman hitchhiked. Dwayne called his brother Greg up in Los Angeles, and Greg hitchhiked from Los Angeles to Jacksonville, arrived here three days later, had his first rehearsal with the band, and then their first gig was here, a gig that was booked for the second coming. They weren't on the bill. It was no Allman Brothers on the bill. It was just the second coming and guests. So that was the debut of the Allman Brothers band right here in Jacksonville Beach, folks. In fact, what was it about? Five blocks from here? Oh, yeah. It's bad. Something like that. So and then they did their second show at the beach a year later. This is after they moved to uh, Macon, Georgia. They came back and uh, did their second show here. It was uh, promoted by Richard Pankin, uh, who was a, um, a, a local wrestler here. I, I knew the guy. He's a pretty nice guy. And this is the second show, and I was at this one. I didn't go to the first one, but I was at this one, and they played um, Mountain Jam. And the girls next to me were complaining. They said, ooh, it sounds like country music. <laughs> ooh, because, you know, hippies hated country music back then. For a while, until they got hit to it. So here's another famous Jacksonville Beach resident. Yeah, you know who that is? Oliver Hardy. Yeah, he lived in Jackson, he lived in Tableau, well Jacksonville Beach was called Tableau Beach, and he was a drummer in some local bands, and he used to play Tableau Beach bars and bistros. He moved here from Milledgeville, Georgia, and became a ticket taker at a downtown theater, and somehow he worked his way into Metro Studios, which was the big uh, movie studio, there were several big movie studios in Jacksonville, believe it or not. Jacksonville could have been Hollywood. Um, but people really didn't want them here, the movie studios here. <coughs> so anyway, he got into uh, Metro Studios and uh, got noticed and became a huge star. And then Metro was swallowed up by Lou's Corporation, which was MGM. So the M in MGM was Metro, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. And it started here in Jacksonville, and so did he. Gosh, can you imagine seeing this guy playing drums in a bar down the street? <laughs> I mean, really, it's true, though. Um, another famous Jacksonville Beach resident is Drew Lumbar. Maybe some of you guys knew him. Yeah. I knew him. Anybody else here knew Drew? Great guy, wasn't he? Great guy, really talented guy. He, he had a band um, here at the beaches. I guess they all went to Fletcher High School called the Soul Searchers. Here's Drew right here. Uh, Anthony Martinich. Anybody know Anthony? Yeah, oh, Anthony. Oh, yeah. Big uh, word? Oh, yeah. It's okay. From our friend Hanks fan. Okay, uh, yeah, Anthony Anthony went to Fletcher with Drew. And then uh, Drew went on to join a, another uh, Capricorn Records group. Uh, 
Uh, thanks to um, Dwayne Allman. This guy here, um, oh man, uh, he was the roadie. He was Dickie Betts' roadie in the Allman Brothers band. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Anybody remember his name? Can you help me here? No, it, it's, I, I'm, my mind's going blank up here. But here's Drew with, with a group called Grinder Switch. Uh, they were signed them to Capricorn Records. And um, they got the name from per, uh, Minnie Pearl. Happy! Uh, Minnie Pearl was a fictional character from Grinder Switch, I guess, Tennessee. So they took that name. And here he is later with a group that was based here at the beach called Dr. Hector and the Drew Injectors. <coughs> really good band. Um, Rick Johnson played saxophone in this band for many years. They had so many people come in and go in the band. I, I have no idea who the other people in the picture are. But uh, he was a good friend of mine. He was a great guy. So I'm going to go back now to... <clears throat> the early, early years of Jacksonville and talk about some of the history before I go into the Southern Rock aspect a little bit. Here's some really um, early figures like Pat Chappelle was a minstrel singer. He sang in blackface, which he didn't really mean. <laughs> but there were black, blackface minstrels, believe it or not, who were imitating the white people who were imitating them. And uh, he got to be very famous, did tour all up and down the East Coast, and he came back to Jacksonville and started his own, uh, let's say, nightclub, Emporium. The he had his own theater, kind of like a vaudeville type thing. This was like uh, early, early 1900s. Jacksonville was a very young city at the time. Uh, another big name was James Weldon Johnson, who was a co-founder of the NAACP, and he and his brother, Rosamond, wrote uh, a song called Lift Every Voice and Sing, which uh, is often uh, called, referred to as the Negro National Hymn. People sometimes call it the Negro National Anthem, but they don't really have a nation, so that's not correct. It's the Negro National Hymn. So he's a very famous gentleman from Jacksonville. He, he left here and uh, settled in, in Harlem, in New York. Then... Uh, Whoops. We got um, Blind Blake. Real name Arthur Phelps, blues player from Jacksonville, got signed to Paramount Records out of Chicago in the early in the 1920s. He was very famous, kind of risque. I think his big hit was Let Me Play With Your Poodle. <laughs> and I don't think it was a dog. <laughs> But it might have been, and nobody knows what happened to Blind Blake. The, the rumor is that he tripped in front of a streetcar and got run over and killed, but nobody really knows what happened to him. He's a very famous guy. Um, anybody remember Pretty Boy Freud used to do one of his songs, Let Me Play With Your Poodle? Anybody remember Pretty Boy Freud? Yeah, so you might remember that song. Um, let's go up to the 30s and 40s. Some fam more famous figures from Jacksonville. <laughs> can you help me? Oh, actually, I can just hit the, the arrow button on this kind of. There we go. Judy Canova, she was part of a group called the Three Georgia Crackers. And I don't think she was from Georgia. I believe she was from Jacksonville. But she had a comedy troupe called the Three Georgia Crackers. They got pretty famous on radio here in Jacksonville, and they parlayed that into a nightclub career in New York, and even got herself into a few, few movies. Uh, Dorothy Shea is also from Jacksonville. She was called the Park Avenue Hillbilly. <laughs> what, I guess it's something like the Beverly Hillbilly. <laughs> and uh, she had a pretty good career in nightclubs and in movies as well. Connie Haynes was actually pretty big. She's, from, she's actually from Savannah, moved to Jacksonville when she was about six years old, had uh, her own radio show, I believe it was on WJAX, which was the downtown uh, radio station owned by the city, and it was an NBC affiliate. And so she went on to um, NBC in New York, picked her up, and she was in uh, uh, Harry James's band with... 
uh, with Frank Sinatra at the same time as Frank Sinatra. So, and she did quite a few movies as well. So she was one of the more famous ones in the 40s. And then Billy Daniels, the story is he stowed away on a freighter to New York City. I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, because show business people are always telling colorful stories about themselves. But supposedly he stowed away on a freighter, landed in uh, Manhattan, he left Jacksonville port, landed in Manhattan, became a singing waiter, and from there he went on Broadway, did an awful lot of Broadway shows, and also some movies as well. So these were famous people from the 30s and 40s. And of course, everybody knows Ray Charles. Magnificent, magnificent Ray, brother Ray. Uh, Ray was born in Albany, Georgia, but he's raised in uh, Greenville, Florida, which is right next to Madison. And uh, he went blind at an early age from glaucoma. His mother sent him to the St. Augustine, the State School for the Deaf and Blind at St. Augustine. And uh, he quit school when he was 15 to become a musician, came to Jacksonville, which was the wrong place for him. He couldn't get anything going for himself. He scuffled around here for about a year. He lived downtown, 70, 732 West Church Street, which is where La Villa School of the Arts is now. And, uh, in, a, in a tenement building with some family friends, some friends of his mother's. And uh, he scuffled for about a year, starved. He actually played in what he called a hillbilly band, a country band called the Florida Playboys. Uh, Marshall Rowland, who became the, um, the owner of WQIK and several other radio stations in the area, took his place in the Florida Playboys. So Ray played piano in the Florida Playboys, not for very long, I think for two weeks. <laughs> and um, Marshall Rowland came in on pedal steel and took his place. And Ray was just really tired of scuffling and really tired of starving. And uh, he asked his friend to take him to the bus station in downtown Jacksonville. This is about 1947. And, this, and um, he asked the ticket taker, What's the farthest city from here? Seattle. Seattle. He says, give me a one-way ticket. So he went to Seattle. He got lucky. He got a gig at a, 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 an illegal casino. And one of the gamblers was a record label owner from Los Angeles, um, Jack Lauderdale, who owned Swing Time Records. And he loved Ray and signed him. And he had a pretty good career on Swing Time Records. And then... He got really, really big when he signed to Atlantic about 1954, I think, something like that. And then he got super huge when he went over to ABC Records and started doing country music. He did I Can't Stop Loving You in 1962, which is a country song, I think, by Don Gibson. And uh, it just went over. I remember it when I was young. It was a huge, huge record. Anybody remember that? Really, really beautiful treatment of an of a old country song. So he, he made uh, quite a splash. And uh, it's, I think it's wonderful. He, he, he couldn't deserve it more. Let's go to the 50s here. Oh, I went too fast. Pat Boone, I'm going to just gloss over him because he was just born here. He was, he was born here and he left here before he was two years old. His, his uh, grandparents lived over in the Fairfax area near where I live. And um, he married Red Foley's daughter. And I think that helped his career a little bit. And then there's a Fletcher High grad named Joanne Campbell. She was a drum major here at Jacksonville Beach. She, um, I don't think she graduated. I think she left school about 16 to join a USO troop and went to Germany with them. And um, she, got, she got a record deal. I can't remember what label, but it's all here in the book, folks. <laughs> and um, she had a hit with a song called uh, The Girl from Wolverton Mountain. Or, or I think it was an answer song to The Girl from Wolverton Mountain. I think her was, was I Am the Girl from Wolverton Mountain. I don't remember. Anybody remember that one? Do you? You know anything about it? No. No. She married um, Troy Seals, uh, brother of uh, 
to got dash sales from Sears and Crofts. She's still around. She's retired. Pat Boone's still around too. He's and you know he's doing. I mean he's doing really well. He's never drank. He never smoked. He's like a fitness freak. And he's just he's getting around real good and he's doing real well. But he's got to be in his eighties. He lives in Los Angeles. Okay, here's a couple of people that came here from um, Oklahoma. The Navy brought him here. Uh, John T. Axton, he was a, a pilot at NAS Jacksonville. And his wife, Mae Axton, and their two children, Johnny Jr. and Hoyt. And Hoyt was a pill, let me tell you. Hoyt, okay, well, for, let me talk about Mae first and I'll come back to Hoyt. May um, was a local, she was a high school teacher at DuPont. DuPont was a high school back then. And she also taught at uh, Paxson and, and a, couple, a couple other schools. She wrote songs in her spare time with uh, one, one with Tommy Durden and a couple with Glenn Reeves. Glenn Reeves used to live here in Jacksonville Beach too. And one of the songs she co-wrote was Heartbreak Hotel which was Elvis' first million-selling record. She knew Elvis through Colonel Parker. She was a, a promoter with um, the Ro uh, Roland that I mentioned. Um, I can't remember his first name. I, just, I said it a little while ago, Roland. And uh, he owned QIK. He used to bring big, big name acts to town, and he brought Hank Snow. And, ha and Elvis was the opener on the Hank Snow show. This is before uh, the colonel signed him and before he was on RCA. So she met Elvis through um, this Hank Snow show that she worked on. <coughs> and um, she went to Nashville before he got signed to RCA and brought him a, a record. And a record, she brought him a record player and took it to his hotel room and played him a demo of Heartbreak Hotel. And he says, hot dog, man, play it again. <laughs> And the singer on that was a, a, a Jacksonville DJ who had had one, one hit as a singer, Glenn Reeves. He used to run the wrestling shows. He had an office here at the beach. Anybody remember Glenn Reeves? The singer on that, on the demo, was Glenn Reeves, who was imitating Elvis. But when Elvis got the demo, he imitated Glenn Reeves, who was imitating him. True story, folks. So she made a lot of money off that. She also wrote many, many other uh, songs. Uh, I can't think of any of them because none of them were very big. Uh, and her son, Hoyt, her son Hoyt, grew up to be a very famous, uh, started off as a folk singer. He graduated from Lee High School, uh, I can't remember what year, I think it might have been 1960. And the night he graduated, he uh, was drunk, I guess. And for some reason, he picked up uh, a, sm a smudge pot. These, they used to have smudge pots on the road for um, flashers. They didn't have flashers back then. They put this uh, the greasy ball with fire coming out of it. Yeah, a little, little ball of oil with fire coming out of it. He picked up a smudge pot, and he heaved it through a plate glass window at Canaver Hardware in uh, North Riverside and burnt the whole store to the ground. And he was arrested and charged with arson, and he got away scot-free, completely scot-free, because the police charged him with the wrong crime. It's not arson when you vandalize somebody's building with a smudge pot. It's arson when you burn down your own building to collect the insurance. And he didn't get anything out of it. So he got off completely, but... Then, for the next 15 years, while the judgment was in effect, he, he would not appear in Jacksonville because one time he did, and the sheriff came uh, up and with a court order and seized the receipts from the show and took all of his money. So he wouldn't play in Jacksonville after that for 15, you know, until the judgment expired. Tommy Durden is the guy who actually wrote Heartbreak Hotel. I've got it on good authority from Marshall Rowland who was the owner of QIK, who told me himself that he'd been playing the Heartbreak Hotel before he even met Meg Axton. She put her name on it as co-writer, and she gave Elvis a third of the co-writing credits for recording the song. But Tommy Durden is the actual guy who wrote it. He was a pedal steel guitar player 
Um, I think he worked with Marshall, no, Marshall played pedal steel too. I can't remember who he worked with, but um, he was on the Toby Dowdy show, uh, Toby Dowdy's Country Frolics back in um, the 50s. And uh, he, he moved, he was uh, from Georgia. I think um, pretty much every Georgia native, if you scratch, a, I mean a Jacksonville native, has at least one parent from Georgia. <laughs> Am I right? Do you have any Jacksonville natives here? Any of your parents from Georgia? Anybody can you confirm this for me? <laughs> okay, what? Else? Anybody else? Anyway, you know, I really think Jacksonville is the capital of South Georgia, don't you? Yes. And I like it, and I like it that about it. Um, Glenn Reeves, I was telling you about, he um, was a DJ from Texas. May Axton brought him to Jacksonville, got him a job with WQIK, or one of Marshall Rowland stations. And uh, he had a hit on Decca Records with, she traded her pigtails for a Tony. <laughs> which I guess meant a firm, right? And uh, he got to be um, a pretty big wrestling promoter here in Jacksonville. I met him one time in his office uh, down right near the beach. He died about, I guess, about 20 years ago. But he sang the demo of Heartbreak Hotel. Who's, who knows who this guy is? That's right. Uh, he, he's from Tampa, Slim Whitman. <coughs> he's from Tampa, and he bought himself a spread in Middleburg and lived there till he died. And uh, he was very, very successful. At one point, he was selling more records in England than the Beatles. Am I right, Fred? Is that right, Fred? Right now. You know, he sold more, at one point he sold more records in England. He outsold the Beatles in England. Uh, remember he did that yodeling? Yeah. He, he was great. And I did meet him one time at Famous Amos. He was standing in front of me in line paying his, his uh, check bill at the checkout counter. He, he had a great reputation and everybody really loved him. And uh, he's just a, a, an excellent showman. Look at that outfit, man. You can tell that guy means business. He don't mess around. Okay, here's Toby Dowdy. I don't suppose anybody here, no, I'm not going to ask, old enough to remember Toby Dowdy's show. I don't even remember. I don't remember. Was it, do you remember it? I remember the main show. Glenn Reeves had a show, too. Yeah, and yeah, he did. Uh, I think, and they probably were on each other's shows because there was a lot of cross pollination back then. Toby actually he did have a hit record in the 40s. Oh, yeah. He had a hit record in uh, 49. Well, maybe not a hit, but he had a national record in 49. Somebody's Been Around Here by Toby Dowdy and the Dixie Lily High Pillars. He came to Jack, I believe he's from Georgia too. He came to Jacksonville, got his own TV show on Channel 4. That was when it was called WMBR. And some of the people on the show, one of his regulars was Shorty Medlock. Who's Ricky Medlock's grandfather? Ah. Rick Medlock from Blackfoot, and, uh, Rick and Shorty played harmonica on Blackfoot's version of Train Train. Anybody remember that? That's Shorty on the harmonica. Uh, Shorty raised Ricky, so Ricky calls him his father, but he's uh, technically his grandfather. And um, look who else was on the show. Johnny Tillotson. He got to be really, really big. Johnny Tillotson was from Jacksonville. He moved uh, to Palatka to look after his elderly grandmother when he was in, in his high school years. He graduated from University of Florida in Gainesville with a degree in communications. Went to the same college I went to. Uh, here's a little bit, oh, wrong way, sorry. A little bit about Johnny here. Here's Johnny. He had, he went from, um, Toby Dowdy's show, Country Frolics was actually the name of the show, to having his own show on Channel 12. And it was called The Velda Show, and Velda was the local dairy. Velda sold milk and stuff. <laughs> Had his own, look at him, now you can tell he was a country singer before he was a pop singer. You can just tell by his get up. Um, Johnny Tillotson's show on The Velda Show every Monday at 7 p.m. And he went on to be really, really big. Here he is uh, in Los Angeles with fellow Jacksonville, uh, former Jacksonville resident Ray Charles in the 60s. But he had, whoops, he had some huge hits. 
uh, poetry in motion. Uh, it keeps right on a hurting. He was always kind of a country, a country type. whole thing over. I better just not press my luck. Uh, okay, Charlie Haas, Singleton was a songwriter. He's never made it big as a singer, but he wrote some fantastic stuff. Mama, He Treats Your Daughter Mean. I think it was Ruth Brown. He wrote the lyrics to Strangers in the Night by Frank Sinatra. You imagine how huge that, huge that was? I bet that kept him in Marlboro's for many years. <laughs> <coughs> he wrote a lot of other big hits too. I, they don't come to mind, but it's in the book, folks. <laughs> and uh, by all counts, I, I knew somebody who knew him, and he said he was a really, really sweet guy, a really huge cat. Um, another famous songwriter, Luther Dixon. Luther Dixon was from Jacksonville, and he came here and through retired, and he died here uh, much later in his later years. And uh, but during his career, he lived in New York. He was um, he was having an affair with Florence Greenberg, who owned Scepter Records, and she made him the vice president of the label and uh, the head of A and R. And he you know, he signed the Shirelles. And he wrote some hits for the Shirelles. He wrote a bunch of big hits. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but it's in the book. <laughs> and uh, he started, he was given his own label by Capitol Records called Lou Dix, which was short for Luther Dixon. He was a very, very successful music executive, songwriter, and producer from Jacksonville. And he, he returned here when he retired. Okay, moving up to the 60s now. We're getting close to the Southern Rock era. I'm still giving you some background. Here's uh, Gary U.S. Bonds, who was from Jacksonville. Um, he, left, he left here at a pretty early age because his mother married a sailor, and they were transferred to Virginia Beach. So he, he broke out of Virginia Beach. But he's a really, really nice guy. He's still around, by the way. And um, I know him quite well. As a matter of fact, I produced some tracks for him not too long ago. Well, he was pretty back then, wasn't he? <laughs> his father was a professor, and his, but his mother divorced him and moved to Virginia Beach, and he got signed to the Grand Records out of uh, Norfolk. And he had, I remember his record when I was a kid. When I, was a kid um, I said, hey. Take a trip with me. Well, down in Mississippi, down in New Orleans. Well, there's honeysuckle growing on the honeysuckle vine. Remember? Remember that one? <laughs> he did a lot of great records, and then in the 80s, when he was completely washed up, Bruce Springsteen saw him at the Holiday Inn. And Spring says, What are you doing, man? Man, I got to I'm going to produce an album for you and get you a record deal, man. And so he did. And he had, uh, what was This Little Girl's Mine? Had a couple of big hits in the 80s. He did a real big guy. And, and he still comes to Jackson because his sister lives here. Anybody met, anybody met Gary? John, you didn't meet Gary? Yeah, I got to meet Shaq Shackleford introduced me to Gary. Shaq worked with Gary. Scott McKenzie, real name, um, Philip Blondheim was born here in Jacksonville. Uh, he grew up around Washington, D.C., and um, he was in The Journeyman with uh, John Phillips from the Mamas and Papas. In fact, uh, John Phillips' um, daughter is named after Scott McKenzie. Mackenzie Phillips is named after him. And uh, anybody remember his hit record? If you're going to San Francisco. Remember that? Be sure to wear flowers in your hair. John Phillips wrote that. But like I said, he only, these two guys were only born here. They didn't spend much time here. And then Jimmy Pittman was, lived a long time in Jacksonville, and he still lives here in Jacksonville. And he was briefly with a group called the 
the night crawlers out of Daytona Beach you had a hit with Little Black A. Remember, that's the first riff you learned on guitar when I was a kid. Little, remember, remember anybody heard that? Little Black A? I saw it concert. You saw the, 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 um, the night crawlers? Yeah, so he was with them briefly when they were opening for the Beach Boys in Daytona. And Murray Wilson, the Beach Boys' father, liked his playing a lot and said, Hey, uh, next time you're in Los Angeles, come out and see me, and we'll try to help you out. And so Jimmy took him, took him up on a hitchhike to Los Angeles, and he showed up at Murray Wilson's doorstep. And said, hey, you told me you'd help me out. So he did. He got him hooked up, and uh, Jimmy joined uh, the uh, Strawberry Alarm Clock, <laughs> who had a number one record with incense and peppermints. And... I don't, I don't know which, honestly don't know which one is him in this photo. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> but, here, but he was in the band alongside Ed King. Yeah, Ed King was the guitar player uh, for the Strawberry Alarm Clock, and then he switched to bass when Jimmy came aboard because they lost their bass player. And then who knows what group Ed King went on to play with. There you go. In fact, um, Skinner met Ed King when they were opening for the Strawberry Alarm Clock here in Jacksonville. And Pittman had another uh, band called Jumbo, which was signed to Ode Records, but they didn't really uh, get anywhere near as big as the Strawberry Alarm Clock. So, let's see. Okay. Man, this thing is really stubborn. Yeah, that's probably good. Okay, before I get to the Southern Rock aspect, I want to talk about the classic sport, which was the Jacksonville group, uh, formed by this guy here, Walter Eaton, who's a professor at FSCJ. He teaches uh, network security. He got a doctoral degree, teaches network security at FSCJ. Uh, if he, he is the actual founder and leader of the classic sport. Robert Nix, uh, who was later with the Atlanta Rhythm Section and, the can and later with the Candyman, uh, was the original drummer for this band, but he dropped out. Well, not the original drummer, but he dropped out early on. They had been through so many people, it's hard to, you really to tell you who was in the band. This was uh, J.R. Cobb, however. Uh, he graduated from Paxson High School the same year as Robert Nix. J.R. Cobb and Nix founded the Atlanta Rhythm Section. And uh, Cobb was in the Classics 4 and the Atlanta Rhythm Session. He was a, you know, a pivotal factor in both of those groups. And then this is Dennis Yost from the North Side. He graduated from Jackson High. And look at that hair thing. <laughs> you could smuggle a pound of pot in that hair. I don't, what is that called? I mean, it's a biscuit? I don't know, but you know, the rest of them were like kind of going v league or kind of half semi beatly except for Wally. And this, he's got this, it looks like a coot skin cat to me. But he's a great singer, Dennis. So here they are after they got big and they had their image kind of redone. And here's, here's Walter again, front and center, because it was his group after all. And uh, there's JR with the beetle cut and there's Dennis with his beetle cut. This was in 68 when they did uh, Spooky. Spooky. I remember that song when I was growing up in California. It was huge. It was uh, like a number two, number, number three record nationwide in uh, early 68. So these guys were huge, 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 and they really put Jacksonville on the map. So now we're going to talk about, oh wait, one more. <coughs> Mouse and the Boys, these guys actually did get a record deal. They actually landed on Bell Records, but they were just like a local team band. And they used to play at the uh, Southside Women's Club a lot. And played out here at the Jacksonville Beach Auditorium a lot. Very popular local band. I think that's Maurice. He went by the name Mouse. I think that's Maurice Samples right there. This is uh, Ro Roland. Last name Roland. Uh, I can't remember. Pete Roland. Who said that? Wow. Yeah. Oh, Michael, you should. I knew you would know. Pete Roland. Is he still around? He's still around. He wrote, um, he wrote a song produced by Danny Davis on RCA Records called Annie Fanny for the Diamond Spore. 
Oh, Jackie Moore. Great. Yeah, there's some hair for you now. <laughs> Jackie Moore had a huge hit in 1971 called Precious, Precious. And it was produced by her cousin, Dave Crawford, who went on to be a very big producer at Atlantic Records and had his own label. He produced Jay Giles' first album at Atlantic Records. And, uh, he was a, a local gospel DJ. He was a piano player, and he, and he, and he went to being a DJ, and he's a gospel musician, and a very prominent one. He also produced um, one for Linda Lindell called What a Man, What a Man, yeah. that Salt and Pepper covered, uh, that they sampled in the, uh, in the, in the 90s. So uh, he was her cousin, and she was just a, a really big, excuse me, that's a bad choice of word, a really um, famous singer, and she lives in Miami, and she's a, a pastor, a minister at a church in Miami, or Fort Lauderdale, something like that. Rita Coolidge graduated from Jackson High, but she didn't live here for very long. And FSU. Yes, and FSU, that's right. Ex uh, experts to train. Yep, you got that right. And she um, didn't live here for very long. Her father, her father also was a pastor. Oh, I, I did. I'm so, sorry, I went the wrong way. Clyde Orange. Anybody know who he is? Okay, John. Brick House. Ah, there you go. So two words: Brick House. He's the singer for the Commodores on the song Brick House, and many others. I mean, that's a bar band standard, right? Yes. There ain't a bar band worth his salt that doesn't play Brick House. And the guy, could, he was the drummer, actually, for the Commodores, and he moved out from behind the drums. But uh, he was in the band same time as Lionel Richie, and Lionel Richie, you know, spun off and had all those middle-of-the-road hits. And uh, Clyde still, um, <clears throat> still runs the Commodores. He still works with them, and he tours with them, and it's his group now. He, he graduated from Northwest High School in Jacksonville. Oh, here's a couple of good ones that were just born here, didn't live here very long. Rex Smith, there's just some big hair. He was uh, like a Broadway musical type guy, and he became pretty big in movies and had a couple of hit records. He actually grew up in Atlanta. And... Um, David Hasselhoff. He went to elementary school in Jacksonville in Arlington at Christ the King Catholic School. And he went on to, you know, to really big things like Baywatch. He's huge in Germany. They love him. He's got his own show in Germany. Okay, we're getting close. Graham Parsons is kind of considered the father of Americana music, uh, which is like country, rock, R&B, all kind of jumbled up together. And so what he was doing in those days was considered risque, you know, mixing country and um, hippie music, you know. Nobody liked that much in those days. But he was in a, in a folk group called the Shilohs out of South Carolina while he was a student here at Bowles. So he, he grew up in Waycross, was born in Winter Haven. But, but only because his mother wanted to be close to her family. And then they moved right back to Waycross. And uh, he moved to Jacksonville, 58, went to school at Bow, Bowles, moved to Winter Haven for a while, and then came back. And he graduated from Bowles and went to Harvard. And then he was on, he joined the Birds, and he was on their album, Sweethearts of the Rodeo, which is considered a seminal uh, country rock landmark. Uh, so he's very, 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 very famous, and he just gets more famous every year. There's a cult around him. There's a, here's an interesting group that doesn't get very much uh, note, but I think they deserve it, which is the bitter end, and they changed their name later to the 31st of February. Uh, it was led by, I guess you could say it was led by Butch Trucks on drums. And... Um, Scott Boyer on guitar and David Brown on bass. And uh, I spoke, beg pardon? 65. They formed at FSU. They just happened to, are you a seven all is that? All right. They just happened to be on assigned rooms on the same dorm. They knew each other 
in passing in Jacksonville, I think maybe they all went to Englewood High, but they just happened to be assigned the same floor on the dorms at FSU, and they said, hey, let's put a band together. So their model was the birds. Everything they did sounded like the birds. In fact, I spoke to David a couple of days ago, and I asked him, were you guys influenced by Graham Parsons? He said, of course we were. We knew of him before he was in the birds. We've been, we knew of him when he was in the Shilohs at Bowles. Um, Butch's father was an optometrist, had a shop over in Five Points, Claude H. Hudson Opticians. Um, David was from Shreveport, Louisiana, moved here as a child. Uh, I think he went to Englewood. He played sax in the high school band. And uh, Scott came here from Binghamton, New York, so Butch was the only Jacksonville native. Uh, these guys went out, they got a deal. This, by the way, this Atlantic Coast Productions ACP was owned by Don Dana, who um, also managed uh, the Royal Guardsmen for a while, you know, the group that did Snoopy and the Red Baron. <clears throat> so they eventually got a deal with the Vanguard Records and they changed their name to the 31st, 31st of February. And as you know, as you probably know, Butch went on to uh, be the drummer for the Allman Brothers Band for his entire career. Um, David Brown went to Miami to become a session player, and then he moved to Macon to become a session player, and then from Macon he joined Boz Skaggs' band. Skaggs was affiliated with Capricorn Records because Phil Walton was Skaggs' manager. So he played with Boz Skaggs for several years, and then he moved to San Francisco with Boz, and uh, he still lives there. Uh, he's retired. Scott Boyer formed, later formed a group called Cowboy and, uh, in 69, and Dwayne Allman got Cowboy a deal, sight unseen with Capricorn Records, because Dwayne Allman had so much clout with uh, Phil Walden, who owned Capricorn Records. So all three of them went on to uh, a, a great deal of fame and glory, and they're all great musicians. Uh, so we're getting to, this, to the... Um, Southern Rock phase of the presentation here. This was the group I told you that I hitchhiked to Woodstock Youth Center to see. I used to hitchhike everywhere to see them. Saw them at Ravine Gardens, saw them at the BNs at Willow Branch Park. They played for free every Sunday in Willow Branch Park. Anybody remember that? Yes, sir. I was there, giving away my age. That was uh, 50 years ago, so you figure it out. This was Dickie Betts and his wife, Dale. And Dickie was the lead singer, and he, well, yeah, they were, had Barry Oakley was in the band also, and he sang lead, and the drummer, John Meeks, who was nicknamed Nasty Lord John, and I'll leave it to your imagination why. Well, it's because he liked underage girls. <laughs> Nasty Lord John used to sing Sookie Sookie by Steppenwolf. He was a really good drummer, too. And Dickie did, they did a single and uh, two sided, a, a single for Steady Records out of New Jersey. They actually got an album deal. The album was never released, but I have a copy of the single. Dickie's singing the A side, I Feel Free by Cream, and it is atrociously off key. In fact, <laughs> I really think I could get him to pay me a lot of money to get that off the market. And his wife, Dale, sang the B-side, which was the cover of Jefferson Airplane's She Has Funny Cars. It's really, really a terrible record and quite, quite an embarrassment to everybody involved. The, a couple of the other members, I told you about Reese Winans. He was a keyboard at the Jacksonville Jam at the Gray House on March 23rd, 1969. But he got dumped because Greg Norman played keyboards and they didn't need two keyboard players. And the bass player was Barry Oakley, who's from Chicago. And he had joined the Second Coming in Tampa. And the reason why they're called the Second Coming is because Leonard Rensler, who owned the r, r Bar downtown and owned a club called The Scene, which is where the Forum was over near my house on, uh, near Roosevelt Boulevard, uh, Leonard Rensler thought he looked like Jesus. <laughs> and so he wanted the band, to, he insisted the band change his name to Second Coming. And they became the house band at the scene, and man, let me tell you, they just took over this town. This was the hottest band anybody had ever seen in Jacksonville up to that point. I mean, and they took over. Um, 
They, there's, this is at Willow Branch Park here, outdoors, playing one of the free concerts that they used to do at Human BN. This is the, uh, the gray house, except you don't see the plaque out in front, but it's there now. There's a plaque. This is the, his, the, the place on Riverside, 2844 Riverside Avenue where the Allman Brothers Band jam took place, but Greg wasn't there. So really, the first Allman Brothers rehearsal was at Butch Trucks' house in Arlington, and I don't think I think that house has since been torn down. Um, here's a picture a friend of mine took. Of, um, Gary took uh, used to run vintage vinyl. It was from a, uh, a eight millimeter Super Eight movie he took at the Forest Inn, which is in my neighborhood on Lake Shore Boulevard, and you can see Butch play a drum set in the corner. This was at the, they used to play for free all the time, constantly. <clears throat> and then one day they just up and moved to Macon because they had a record deal with Phil Walden who was based in Macon. He wanted to keep an eye on them. <laughs> and here they are in Macon uh, at, at a church. I can't remember the name of the church, but I remember seeing, I remember walking into Hoyt Hi-Fi with my friend Jesse Gay. You remember Jesse. Jesse and I walked into Hoyt Hi-Fi one day and there's the album with this picture on the cover of that. Is that? And the, and the uh, record store clerk goes, yeah, it sure is. And, we, and our heads just snapped and we went, oh my God, these local guys made it big. Because uh, now that he, he does look like Jesus. <laughs> Doing his best Jesus imitation. And uh, there's Butch and there's Dickie Dwayne, Greg, and J-Mo. J-Mo was a drummer that uh, Bill Walden brought in from Mississippi. Who had, he had played with uh, Percy Sledge and some of the other acts that Bill Walden managed out of Mecca. So the second coming guys were um, just Dickie and Barry. And as you know, Butch was in the 31st of February at the bitter end. But, you know, the thing is, the, the, the Allman Brothers was built on the Second Coming's fan base and foundation and repertoire. They, the Allman Brothers came in and learned a lot of the songs that the Second Coming were already doing. So you could, you could say the Second Coming morphed into the Allman Brothers band, more so than not. Uh, here's, a group, here's Cowboy. Uh, this is the group um, Scott Boyer founded in 69, same, same year Allman Brothers were founded, only a few months later. I don't know which one here is Scott Boyer. I know that's Tommy Talton here from Orlando. I can't tell you which one is uh, Scott Boyer. And here's a later version of Cowboy with David Brown from The Bitter End. Went back to work with Scott Boyer. So there's David Brown. Randall Bramlett uh, from um, Statesboro, Georgia. And I don't know, I think that, I don't know, there's Tommy Talton there, but I can't pinpoint Scott Boyer. I think that might be him, but I'm not sure. Ah, so here we come to one of the most famous bands from Jacksonville. Certainly the most famous Southern rock band of all time, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, this is them. This is uh, Alan Walden, their manager, who was Phil Walden's brother, and he could not get them a deal with Capricorn. Phil Walden wouldn't sign. Uh, this is Eddie Floyd, the guy who sang um, "Knock on Wood." He was the partners in this venture. The three partners were you know, Hustlers Incorporated: were Alan Walden, Eddie Floyd, and Pat Armstrong. Pat and I are partners in First Coast Films, and we're producing a PBS miniseries called Jacksonville and the Roots of Southern Rock. And Pat is my partner, and he is the one who brought Leonard Skinner to Alan Walden in Macon. Pat discovered Leonard Skinner, which is a fact. Brought him to Macon, well, he brought, actually, he brought Alan Walden to Jacksonville and put on a showcase and the only band Alan liked was Leonard Skinner, so he signed him, and this is the signing. Uh, of course, you know, I don't, I don't know who this guy is. I can't place him. Uh, you know, get, boy, look at Gary 50 pounds ago. <laughs> Alan, I, I, worked, I worked in Alan's band briefly. What a nightmare that was. Uh, Ronnie Van Zandt, Bob Burns, and Larry Johnstrom. So hardly any of these guys 
uh, even made it to the first uh, to the first album that was produced by um, Al Cooper. I, Burns was on it, but Junction was gone by that point. Um, Burns didn't last much longer after that. He was replaced by Artemis Pyle. Junction was replaced by Leon Wilkinson. And uh, they went through many, many lineup changes. Uh, here's, Lee, speaking of Leon Wilkinson, here they are at Finocchio's in Atlanta. This was uh, when Al Cooper found them. They already had a record deal with Muscle Shoals, uh, as a production deal with Muscle Shoals, and no label wanted it. They shopped it to every major label and got turned down by every single label. Until Al Cooper, who had played with Bob Dylan and had his own band, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, he got kicked out of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, by the way, and replaced by David Clayton Thomas. But he, was, he moved to Atlanta, and he was scouting talent in Atlanta, and he found these guys in this club, and he signed them. And the rest, as they say, is history. So Al Cooper was really responsible for making stars on Leonard Skinner because they had been passed on by everybody. They were, they were pretty much washed up by the point Al Cooper discovered them at Finocchio's, but he breathed new life into them. I mentioned Shorty Medlock earlier. Here's his, his grandson, Rick Medlock, with a group called Blackfoot. Now, here's something interesting. When Leonard Skinner went to Muscle Shoals to record their very first album, which went unreleased for 10 years, the one that couldn't, nobody would want it, these two guys, um, Rick Medlock, and which one is Greg Walker? These two guys, that's Greg Walker, uh, were in Leonard Skinner at the time, and Ricky's actually sang two albums on Leonard Skinner's first unreleased album. Um, I mean, he played drums with them also, and Greg Walker briefly played uh, bass with them. And they didn't last very long because they wanted to get back out uh, and do their own thing with Blackfoot. So they bolted short. When they saw Leonard Skinner, it wasn't going anywhere. Mm. Or so they thought. <laughs> um, this is a group also from the west side. Uh, Ronnie Van Zant's younger brother, Donnie. Um, I auditioned for this band when it was called Sweet Rooster. And I'm here now, which tells you what happened. <laughs> it didn't pan out too well. Um, mo I think most of these guys were from Jacksonville, except Jack Gronin was a JU student. Uh, Don Barnes is their lead singer. Uh, he's from Jacksonville. He played in a lot of teen bands, the Camelots, stuff like that. Uh, well, excuse me, Donnie Van Zandt was putatively the lead singer, but Don Barnes sang one of the old hits, like Holding On Loosely, Rockin' Into The Night, What If I'd Been The One, and on and on. Like, these guys had more hit records than any band from Jacksonville. I don't know that they sold in a conglomerate more records than, any, than Leonard Skinner, but they had more hit singles than any. They had a dozen hit singles. Jeff Carlisi, I know him very well. He's also from Boston, um, and he, uh, he lives in um, Destin now, and he uh, co-wrote a lot of their hits. Great guitar player. He's the guy who plays a solo on Hold On Loosely. Ah, this is Pat Armstrong's protégés here, Molly Hatchet. He found him in a local bar. Um, Danny Joe Brown had been a roadie for uh, Bobby, Bobby Ingram's band. Um, I can't remember the name of his band, but Danny Joe Brown was a roadie, and they discovered he could sing, so they stuck him in front of Molly Hatchet. Uh, they were actually pretty good musicians. They were actually were pretty good. Ben Thomas, great bass player. Bruce Crump, fabulous drummer. He went to bowl school also. And um, Dwayne Rowland, and this, this is a guy, from Steve Holland from uh, Virginia Beach. In fact, he dated my sister before he was in this band. And uh, every one of them are dead, except Steve, and he's not in good shape. Every, the rest of them are all dead, which just goes to show you, you know, that rock and roll lifestyle ain't too healthy. So maybe it's a good thing I didn't get a 38 special. Uh, another good friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Doherty, he was the best drummer in Jacksonville by a long shot, but uh, he was also a great singer. Sounded a lot like Paul Rogers from Free. 